per Carolina pod fans, mm. we're, we're getting close to 500 guests. Really? Yeah, on the pod. Thanks for keeping up with the stats that they sent us, James. <laughs> so when we get good guest suggestions from listeners, we say, absolutely, that Lock sounds like in. a great idea, if they are, in fact, good suggestions. Today, we have just such a good suggestion. Nick Bailey came through with a great suggestion. He said, hey, you know what you should do? You should talk to James Hurst. And we're like, yeah, we'd love to talk to James Hurst, yeah. Nick. Sorry, he's so big time, we can't get to him. <laughs> you got any idea how to get in touch with him? And he's like... Oh, yeah. He's actually sitting right next to me. And now he's sitting next to us. James, a longtime NFL veteran, four-year Tar Heel, four-year Tar Heel starter in studio today. James, thanks so much for coming by. Absolutely. This is uh, this is a real real privilege. Um, I'm excited to be here and be back on campus where I, uh, I don't know, feel like everything started. Met my wife here. Football really took off. So uh, this, is, this is the place to be. What's going on in the life of James Hurst right now? Huge, massive transitions. Um, <laughs> retired after 10 years in the NFL, uh, six seasons with the Baltimore Ravens, four with the New Orleans Saints, um, and then also just had our first child, uh, baby girl, Darcy Rose, on April 27th. So she's uh, a little over four months. Awesome. So we're just sorting through um, not having to move back and forth and the stress and anxiety of playing football and learning how to parent. So uh, all great things, um, very, very exciting things, and uh, just feel like it's it's a really sweet spot in life right now. I obviously want to talk football, but, like, what is Dad James Hurst like? What has been cool? What has been overwhelming? How, how has it worked out? We've been very blessed. Uh, Darcy is extremely chill. She um, <laughs> For now, James. Yeah, for got now. that Hirsch blood. <laughs> we're, we're waiting, right? Like, we're, we're waiting for the next thing. Um, but she's changing so fast right now, um, as, as most people probably know. Um, but I, I, I think I'm pretty uh, even, even keeled. Uh, my mom, that's definitely a trait I got from her. You know, not too high, not too low, um, which is also me and on the football field <laughs> so there's definitely some carry over there um but yeah just it's it's really sweet it's really awesome to to have a girl and uh to try to figure out how to raise her and we say right now we're um you know keeping her alive feeding her and letting her sleep giving her shelter and then the parenting will come later and honestly the parenting seems terrifying so we're gonna enjoy this time yeah just this part yeah just just make sure the basics that's yes, all we need yeah, right now yeah. the part where she can't talk Really underrated. <laughs> <laughs> she started. She started babbling, and uh, we've got some home video of my wife when she was, oh, I don't know, you know, three, four, five years old. And we have said, as soon as she learns words and sentences, it's not going to stop until uh, she's out of the house. So, so we're really going to enjoy the little babbling um, right now. What's it like this fall, waking up on Monday mornings? And I'm guessing not have various aching body parts, not going to the facility. What, what's that been like? Mondays are much better. <laughs> um, you know, honestly, it's uh, it's a really great feeling. Um, both my wife and I have been super affirmed in so many different ways. Uh, we feel like the Lord has blessed us and the signs that he gave us and it was time to retire. Um, 10 years is, is probably nine more years than I expected to play in the NFL, to be honest. Um, I broke my leg in my last collegiate game in the Belk Bowl and went undrafted. So um, it really felt like there was a huge mountain to climb. And fortunately, I was able to make the team and then another year and then another year. And I was able to become a starter. And, um, you know, it really just kept going. But um, the career was great, loved every minute of it, loved all the experiences, the stadiums, the wins, the teammates, all those things. Um, but it's, it's just a different stage of life, and I'm grateful for all the experiences I had and excited for uh, new ones in a, in, a different, you know, in a different place. Ha Not many people play 10 years in the NFL, especially at a position where you're, you're, it is physical down there. Ha how were you able to do it? You know, I've thought, I've thought about this a lot. A lot of people ask, um, you know, questions similar to this. And I think it comes down to, well, one thing that's mostly out of your control is injuries. Sure. Um, they can, you know, derail someone's career in an instant. Uh, it can be their last play. You know, you really don't know the severity of, of any sort of injury that can happen in this sport. As everyone knows, it's incredibly violent. Um, but the next thing I would say is just trying to be coachable. Um, coaches are people. And they have to trust the players that they're putting on the field. And I think at the end of the day, um, through meetings and practices, if you try to do what the coach is teaching you to do, 
it's going to grow their trust in you. And when that trust reaches a certain point, they're going to put you in, whether that's as a starter or a substitute. Um, they're going to trust you. And, and to be frank, they're going to trust you with their job because as a coach, the, the player's output, that's what the coaches are graded on. So as that trust builds, um, I think it gets the coaches in a place where they're comfortable enough to, to put you in or suggest putting you in. And um, when I got those opportunities, I took advantage of them and I played well. And every single game you play well, I, you know, I'd say it, it buys you a few more games um, and, and allows you maybe some, some not so good games. Um, but I was, very, I was very grateful for the positions I was in. Um, and that was one advantage of being undrafted was I got to pick where I went. There are a few right. teams that called me and wanted to sign me, um, but the Ravens had a really good situation on their depth chart. They were thin on the offensive line, and I thought if I could make the team, you know, one injury, two injuries, uh, I might find myself starting, and that's exactly what happened. One of the head coaches you played for, John Harbaugh, I feel like is the lesser-known Harbaugh, but sneakily has been in Baltimore almost two decades now. Yeah. What is it about him that has made him – also able to have that kind of longevity and what kind of coach is he to play for he's a great coach to play for um you know they released me after six seasons with them and then uh two years after that maybe three years after that we turned around and played them in new orleans which was uh, a really crazy experience as a whole um, but even after the game you know i saw him after the game shook his hand he came right over to me um and then even later than that, you know, we texted back and forth a few times. So he's someone that really cares about his players. It was very interesting to me, the two different coaches I had, or the two of the first different coaches I had, John Harbaugh and Sean Payton, how different they were, but equally how successful they, they both were and with using different styles. Um, Coach Harbaugh was, in my opinion, he was a great people manager. So he, he was very gifted at motivating people. Um, he trusted his coordinators and his position coaches to do their job. He didn't try to um, over-involve himself in things that he wasn't as knowledgeable as these other coaches was, which to me is honestly a sign of, of great humility. And I think that puts him in a good position. You know, When he's interviewing these assistant coaches, and after that interview, he determines, you know, hey, this is the level of autonomy I believe that they should have. And then he follows through that through the season, win or loss, good or bad. Um, and I think that's great. I think that's what allows that organization to be so stable and so successful. Go ahead. What about Sean Payton? Because you mentioned they were different. What, what style is he using? So Sean Payton is an offensive mastermind. I mean, the snippets of like game plan meetings that that I got to see or when he would come into the offensive line room he would talk about a specific scheme on you know a short yardage play or or a third and you know four play and just talking about all the variables that can happen I mean the guy knows everything there is to know about offensive football and it's crazy to see so he is in full control of the offense whereas Harbaugh like he's he's more overseeing the defense the offense the special teams Sean Payton is this offense that that's his baby and defense, defense coordinator, that's your baby. So I expect you, <laughs> I expect you to treat that like he's treating offense. So it was really cool to see. I'm glad I got those two different experiences um, to see. You know, there's more than one way to skin a cat, and uh, I got to play for for two people that did it well. Was it what you wanted it to be? I have to imagine that yeah. You know, when you're as successful, and and for those who don't remember, I mean, James was very highly recruited coming out of high school, so. I mean, I have to imagine this was something that you had thought about for a long time. Was it Was it what you wanted it to be? I think it was. Uh, it definitely exceeded all expectations I had. Like I said, I did not ever expect to play 10 years. Um, and a lot of things definitely fell my way in that regard. Unfortunately, you know, I think the things that surprised me most were probably the the worst parts of, of the National Football League, the business side of it, um, how competitive it is. It's so cutthroat. Many Mondays I'd come in, you know, you talk about Mondays being different now. I remember early in my career, many Mondays I'd come in and say, I might not have a job. Uh, yeah. You know, I played, I played really poorly or the team played really poorly, uh, particularly those Ravens Steelers game. Uh, quick story, I vividly remember my rookie year. We played at Pittsburgh. Both of our starting cornerbacks were out that game. So we had two backups playing the same game. Been through five touchdown passes. I mean, we lost the game a lot to a little come back, walk in Monday morning to do our normal like workout. And uh, both those those backup corners that started that game, both were released that day. And so for me, that was like a real reality check. Like, man, 
this can be over in an instant. And so making making sure, one, you're obviously working hard as you can and doing everything in your control to, to take advantage of your situation. And two, like, hey, sometimes bad things happen and you might end up somewhere else. Um, so that, that helped me early in my career just to kind of understand, hey, this is the kind of business that we're in and um, this, stuff, this stuff is serious. You started playing because it was fun and, and you liked the game. As you realized, okay, this is now my job and I'm providing for my future family, how, if at all, did you have to treat it differently? Yeah, the shift from college to the NFL was was massive on the field. Uh, but then in other ways that people might not think about is college, you're balancing school with football. And so that balance, is that's not easy to do. Um, but then the NFL, it's all football. Like this is what you do all day, every day. And so I think it's easy – particularly early in an NFL career, to come out and say, wow, I have all this free time, right? I watch film for an hour a day like I did in college, and I practice for three hours a day, and I worked out for an hour a day just like I did in college, and now I've got the rest of my day to do whatever, play video games, go hang out, go eat somewhere, right? But the reality is that's not going to keep you around very long. And so adjusting to, okay, how do I spend my time best? Do I need to come early in the morning? Do I need to stay late? after practice, after work that day, to, to get things done, to accomplish things. Uh, that's really important. And then on top of that, the offseason is, is so important because for the first time in your football career, you can do whatever you want with your offseason. So uh, I was lucky enough, Marshall Yonda, was a, he was a great player for the Ravens, uh, 13 years, many-time Pro Bowl or All-Pro, probably be a Hall of Fame player. He, was a big, he had a big impact on uh, my career. And he helped me, you know, just to be there and answer questions about, hey, like, how do you lift? What do you lift? Where do you lift? When do you lift? You know, all these different things. Do you watch film in the offseason? How do you do skill work? How do you do position work? Just answering all those questions. And then each year, the offseason changes so drastically. You have to learn what you did that season, what you need to get better at. And then you kind of change the offseason and mold it into what you need during that offseason to prepare for the upcoming season. So it was a lot of time management and um, entering that new phase of life and having a lot more autonomy of, hey, this is what I need to work on and this is how I'm going to get it done each and every day. Is that unusual? To, because when it comes down to it, you're competing with somebody for their job or their snaps. And as we've talked about, I mean, it's, it's your livelihood. Is it unusual to have somebody who's willing to share those things and do those things? In my experience, it wasn't. Now, I, I was very fortunate to play for two um, highly winning organizations. And I think in winning organizations, people are less feel for, fearful of their jobs and they might lose their job because when you win, everything everything's great, sure. right? Everyone's happy um, and everyone wants to help each other. So in my, in my experience, I had a lot of people that were open and willing to talk about you know, what they did to get better or something that helped them along the way. Um, so I'm grateful for that. Now I have also heard the other side of that on, on some not so winning teams where uh, people might not be as helpful, but I'd say for the, for the most part, you're going to find people that want to help. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, when you go out on the field on Sundays, that's what matters. And if, if you have a chance to play and you take care of your job, you should keep your job. And so uh, I think a lot of people have that mindset and they want to help younger players, you know, get in, the, get in the fold faster and help them any way they can. Other than winning games, how do organizations become winning organizations? Like, how do they become the type of club that players talk about, oh, you want to go there because they, they know what they're doing? Yeah, um, that's, that's a really good question. So in college, at least when I was getting recruited, it seemed a lot like, hey, come check out our facilities. These are all the things we have to offer. This is why you should come play here. In the NFL, it's the focus is not on the facilities. Um, it's it's much more about the people and, and the management style. And you know, I really go back to Coach Harbaugh and kind of the model that the Ravens had. Ozzie Newsom was a general manager when I first got there, and seeing the way that all the coaches, not just the coaches though, the coaches, um, the support staff, all the people that worked in that building, they worked together, and you could tell everyone had the same objective. That no one was clashing um no one was trying to you know one up the other person you can tell that that healthy environment is is what helped make them into a winning organization now at the end of the day you got to draft players that can play and players that mesh well in the locker room i think that's really important and um the saints were particularly vocal about 
they want to have a locker room environment that is positive. And when they bring people in, they think about how will this person impact the locker room environment. So, and I totally agree with that. I think that's very important to have people in each position group that get along with each other and also get along with people from other position groups because people are vastly different. The offensive line looks very different than the defensive backfield. And so to have people that can bring everyone together um, across those different experiences and different backgrounds is, is really important because on Sunday, it's what's going to make you, you know, give that little bit extra for the guy next to you if you know him and you care about him. I want to get to Carolina in a second. Um, there were some allegations against you during your time playing. What I have to imagine that's like an assault on your character almost. How, how did you manage that? Because I would think that that affects you past just what's happening on the field. I would think. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that was that was a really really tough part in my career. Um, Still to this day, um, we don't know what the drug test was about or what I failed for. We talked to our nutritionist, and um, you know they supply the supplements, and everything you take is safe. It's what's called NSF certified, which is a third-party organization that makes sure that's what's on the label is what's in the bottle, basically, is what sure. it says. Um, so that was really, really tough because we sent everything in and uh, to a company that tests, tests supplements, and they never found anything. So to this day, I still don't know um, where... It was Osterin was the was the drug that I tested positive for, and at the time it was the it was kind of you know the thing that everyone's testing positive for, and you call around and you talk to people um, that fail for the same thing, and I talked to three different guys that had the same experience, so it's really unfortunate. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it ended up with me being released by the Ravens um, four or five months later, and then actually uh, COVID shut the state down the very next day. So there was a moment there after year six where I was like, well, maybe this is it. This seemed, you know, six years is a long time. A couple uh, things happening that aren't great, right? Yeah, now. yeah. So uh, maybe, maybe I should just shut it down. Uh, but then the Saints called, and I signed a one-year deal there. And um, they really, the Saints really helped me love football again. On top of that drug test experience in Baltimore, I had a few other difficult things happen. And I was really feeling down. Um, I was seeing the worst of the NFL all at once. And so when the Saints called and signed me, when I showed up in New Orleans, there was not one person that asked, like, hey, did you do it? Uh, I felt that I was trusted. You know, I had kind of stated my case in a couple different ways and explained what happened. And I never felt like anyone doubted that. You know, I got into the building and they signed me knowing that I was suspended for four games. So that meant a lot to me that they had done their homework and talked to people that knew my character well and um, trusted that, you know, it was a fluke and that I was going to come in and work hard, and as soon as I could play, I was going to be a contributor, and, and that's what happened. You feel like someone to whom your character is important. In the age of Google, anytime anyone meets you or something, they're going to go type your name in, and yep. that's going to be one of the things that's comes, that comes up. Absolutely. How do, you, how do you become okay with the fact that you can't go around to every single person you meet and be like, look, I want to let you know this isn't actually what happened, and you just kind of have to live your life. Can yeah. we delete some stuff off Google, James? Maybe we could figure that <laughs> well, who out. Who do we That'd need be- to talk to? I mean, that would be great. That would, that would be worth our time, I think. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's absolutely true, and I've had people that I don't know, you know ask me, hey, what's the deal, or, you know, call me names, or, you know, tell me I'm a cheater, and that hurts because um, my character means a lot to me, and I I do things that defend my char- character and uphold my character, and, and that was a really tough situation for me, but at the end of the day, one, I couldn't control that drug test um, somehow, even though you think you can, and then two, you know, all these people that, that don't know me, unfortunately, I would hope they'll give me the benefit of the doubt, and then I hope if they know someone that knows me, they can they can go to that person. Um, but all I can do is is live my life in a way that's um, upstanding and and honoring to God, and and that's what I try to do. And even after this situation, as much as I did want to go around to every single person <laughs> and say, "Hey, I didn't do it. I promise." Here's the story. Um, there's just not enough time in the day, and so I couldn't control it. And that's something that was again, it was very very difficult for me. That was a dark time uh, for me. Uh, and my family. I mean, my wife too. She was just yeah. as affected seeing the things online, you know, that were said about me. So that was really tough. Um, but at the end of the day, it put me in New Orleans, and that really revitalized my career. And um, we had an incredible four years in New Orleans. We we absolutely love the team and the city so much. So we're very very somehow grateful for that situation <laughs> arising. Um, okay, I have this. 2010 LSU was your first game, yep, right? Yep. I, well, I was just confirming. Yep. 
obviously a very a volatile time for Carolina football. Oh what gosh. was like brand new freshman James Hurst thinking when all of a sudden everybody's checking to see who's getting on the bus and oh by the way you're starting this game against LSU. Oh yeah. Yeah. So my I um actually graduated high school a semester early. I enrolled at UNC in January to do spring practice. I right. wanted to get ahead and my goal was to start as a true freshman. And my I kid you not, my first team meeting, I sit down and they shut all the doors. Like it was very solemn, the coaches. And I didn't really know them at this point, right? I'm like, oh, this is like really serious. <laughs> they were like, hey guys, we're in a lot of trouble. Here's what's gonna happen. And I'm like, I can't believe I'm here right now. <laughs> like this is crazy. Um, but yeah, it was it was super unfortunate uh, because on paper that was you know probably the most talented team that I was a part of here at Carolina. And uh, we hate to see it. We almost beat LSU that day. We we could have beat them. You know, it was down to the last play kind of situation. Um, but it's you know what could have been. We'll we'll never know. Um, but it was fun. I know to play with um, some of those guys that played, and obviously the fallout from that was really unfortunate. And uh, you know today all those things seems like are probably allowed. I don't I don't even I don't even try to keep up with the rules anymore because they're night and day different than what they were when I played. Basically, the rules are there are no rules. Okay, perfect. Yeah. perfect. Yeah. That's, that's cage match. Okay, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. <laughs> um, you, of course, that first year played for Butch Davis, who also had to recruit you, and as Jones mentioned, very highly touted recruit. What made Butch Davis such an effective recruiter that assembled all that talent that, that was part of that team? So, again, maybe this is my style because I think I keep coming back to this, but the coaches that he assembled were unbelievable. Um I felt like they cared about me. And as a, you know, what was I, 17, 18 year old, 16, 17, 18 year old kid, um, I wanted to be wanted. And uh, Sam Pittman was the offensive line coach, who's now the head coach at Arkansas. Um, he is maybe my favorite coach that I've ever played for. Mm -hmm. He came to my high school, as, as many other schools did, and he was the only coach that did not negatively recruit against other schools. Mm -hmm. And that to me was like, wow, this is different. All these other coaches are saying similar things. Coach Pittman, not once. All he talked about was UNC, here's what we have, here's who we are, we want you to come here. And that to me was like, all right, easy enough. Like I, I really, to be honest, I really didn't have a hard time choosing UNC. Um, he painted the perfect picture, and then obviously when we got to come here um, you know, on visits and see it for ourselves, it was, it was pretty easy to choose here. And sure enough, I meet my wife here, and uh, you know now we're living nearby. So it was perfect fit for me, and uh, I really can't imagine going anywhere else. So I mean, what a couple of years! I mean, you've got Butch, and then Everett Withers, and then Coach Fedora comes in, and you can't go to a bowl another year that you guys are very good in, yep. in 2012. And just what what was that experience like? Never really, it feels like getting any consistency during your time here. It was. Really, it was really unfortunate. Um, and on top of that, on top of those head coaches you mentioned, I had four different strength coaches, yeah. which is really tough as a developing player. I mean, physically in college, you see so much growth in guys from freshman year to senior year. And no no offense to any of those strength coaches, they were all great. They just don't have the time to get you in their program to be able to establish you know, sort of a foundation and then build on that. Because as soon as we start building on that, you know, another coach came in. So that was really, really tough. Um, felt like, you know, you might have missed out on some big time opportunities and experiences. Um, but again, it's one of those things. It's like, you know, it's out of my control. Um, you know, we enjoyed the time we had with the players we had. And um, especially the year, you know, we couldn't go to the bowl. Um, I, we supposed to, we would have been eligible for the AC championship, yes. right? That's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. So um, just feel like you miss out on a, on a huge opportunity and, and you feel bad about that. Um, but again, yeah, it's, it was out of our control and you just move on and you try to win the games. And at the end of the day, when you're on the field um, on Saturdays, you're not thinking about, you know, maybe the postseason. you're out there playing as hard as you can, enjoying that time with some of your best friends that you have and, um, and trying to win games. Despite it, somewhat kind of being a madhouse in Chapel Hill during those four years you were a part of some very memorable on-field games I mean the, the LSU game the the insane ending to the Music City Bowl the Geo game and 12 when you think about on-field stuff from when you were here what are some of the moments that stand out to you the Geo punt return um, against State was 
the loudest I've ever heard the stadium. Um, and particularly, I played terribly in that game. So I'm like, honestly, I'm kind of on the sideline like, you know, what was me, right? And then Gio just makes magic happen out of nothing. Um, so I'll never forget that day um, forever. And then, like you said, the Music City Bowl, they made the 10-second the runoff rule because yeah. of that game. Yeah. So uh, being a part of football history, it feels like, even though it's pretty nerdy, I think, if you were to tell <laughs> that to an average person, uh, it's pretty cool. Also, I mean, I remember walking off the field, getting bottles thrown at us, oh, yeah. you know, in, in Nashville. Um, but it, it was so much fun. And that was such a great – I mean, that was just a great football game. So to be able to – come out on top of that was even better uh, my freshman year and honestly it was like is this what college football is this is pretty incredible um, <laughs> but like you said it was it was pretty much a madhouse for four years so okay two things one you got to play with your brother some yeah uh, Nelson who we know well tell us about that experience and then secondly Bryn Renner is going to be doing radio oh, this yeah. year yeah what what are some things do you have some sneaky stories that if Bryn starts getting a big head that I can take him <laughs> down a couple notches if need be I might send those uh DM yeah, we need on to, Instagram yeah, we yeah, need yeah. to do that I'll, off I'll, air we can I'll probably I'll probably send those uh type those out it might take me a while to get through all those um but playing my brother was incredible it was a dream come true um vividly remember we were at Georgia Tech who can't stand Georgia Tech we never I don't think I I was over oh for four against them in my college career which was very unfortunate. Um, but we had a play. I think it was Coach Shoup was offensive coordinator. Um, me and my brother were split out wide. Gio runs like a swing route. Gio's a decoy. So me and my brother are like blocking for him. Then my brother releases, catches a touchdown in the in the back corner of the end zone at Georgia Tech. And like that moment, um, we were really close with Gio. So celebrating like us three together before the, the reinforcements arrived. Um, I'll never forget that. That was, that was really awesome. But he's one of my best friends to this day. He's living in Wake Forest. Um, so we get to see each other all the time. And just having a chance to play literally neck to each other. Uh, we had some pretty dominant double team blocks. I'll say that. <laughs> we, could, we could go back yeah, on the film. Boys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we could go back on film and, uh, and definitely watch some of those and enjoy those. But that was, that was pretty awesome. And I'm realizing now how unique that is to be able to play um, you know, with your brother at the collegiate level. Were the Hearst boys competitive growing up? I feel like there might have been some battles. We were very competitive. Uh, my brother was always stronger than me. We actually, there was a story that I tell. Um, we were in high school. I don't quite remember. He's two years older than me, so he might have been a senior. I was a sophomore to kind of set the stage. Um, one night I made a protein shake because, you know, we're trying to bulk up, get big. Sure. So I make a protein shake in the kitchen. He comes in. Big brother's me, right? He's like, that's that's mine. That's my protein shake. I'm like, it's it's actually not. I just made it. So I kind of push back, you know? And then he holds me up against our kitchen cabinets and says, that's my protein shake. And I say, that's your protein shake. <laughs> so uh, that was that was very Doesn't memorable. like the Nelson no, I know. He wanted that protein shake, I'm telling you. <laughs> Have you guys ever seen him over a protein shake? That's maybe, that's maybe what we're missing. Um, but yeah, yeah, we were, we were very competitive. But we made, I mean, he really paved the way for me in so many ways. Um, you know, he was recruited, and every time he would go on a recruiting visit, I was right there with him. And, you know, coaches see a really tall, big kid behind a brother that's getting recruited. They're like, how old is he? What position does he play? So I was on people's radars probably before I was even in high school. And um, not to mention, he played defensive end. I played offensive tackle in high school. So we were literally going against each other in practice. And he got the better of me more often than not. But I know that that made me better at such a such a faster rate. And I think that that's what able – that was – that was what helped me um, be able to go into college with, um, you know, maybe a little bit of an edge over some other freshmen. What, uh, what are the next steps now? I mean, I know you've got a million things happening, but have you even given thought to that yet? Yeah, we, um, I've had some pretty cool opportunities kind of honestly fall in my lap. I'm currently doing um, some analyst work for a local news station in New Orleans, um, doing a little um, – video segment every week after the games which has been really fun and they just approached me and they said you know we liked how you interviewed during your time in New Orleans and was wondering if you'd be interested in doing this job so I'm doing that for this season and it's it's been really fun so far uh, especially the Saints one this this might this might not be the right crowd for this the Saints beat the Panthers last week 47 to 10 so that was a pretty yeah. easy interview yeah, that's to an do. easy way yeah. to get started yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was an easy way to get started um, but it's been really fun just staying connected down there in New Orleans. I'm working on my MBA um, through Indiana University. The NFL has a program with them that they help people get enrolled and uh, do some tuition reimbursement stuff. So I'm currently doing that. I'm 
I'm a full-time student and it's uh I don't miss being a full-time student, but but we're making it work um, for maybe one day a coffee shop. I, I love coffee, um, so that's kind of in the back of my mind, uh, but definitely not you know at the front of my mind right now with a little baby girl and just trying to figure out some routine and rhythm um, for being at home for the first time um, in ten years. So it's it's um, it's really cool. I'm excited about the opportunities and the people that I've already got to meet, um, and you know I know Amanda and I will stay involved with new orleans however we can however that comes about uh we really we really love the city and love the people there um but we're just so happy to be here and and to see where time will take us you've got your family with you here today and said you're looking forward to just sort of walking around chapel hill walking across campus when you do that with them what do you what do you think about and what comes to mind when you're in chapel hill i think um the thing i think about about college is it's four years but it seems like you make 10 years worth of memories. And it's because, you know, every day, every night after class, after practice, you can just, you know, text your friends, say, hey, what are you guys doing? Go hang out for two, three hours. Uh, maybe the sex, same thing the next day. And to be able to have that flexibility, you don't realize it in the moment. Um, I'm going to butcher the, the Andy Bernard quote from The Office, but it's like, you wish you knew you were in the good old days while you were still in them. And I think that's so true. Uh, the, the amount of people that you meet and the amount of time that you have to, to really connect and grow those relationships, you'll never experience that ever again in your life. So I think both of us just look back so fondly on our friends and the places where we would hang out and meet up and, uh, and eat food a la Merits. Um, it's, it's just it's cool to be back. And it's cool to reminisce on, on the great times that you have.